Commander Riker offers a rod of par steel. Data keeps his medals in a case. And Chief O'Brien's poker luck is always lousy until he starts on the dealer's right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton and Denise Crosby. Hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> My name is Ryan T. Huss. Today, we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation, episode nine of season two, entitled The Measure of a Man, written by Melinda M. Snodgrass, directed by Robert Shearer. This is February 11th, 1989. We have a very special guest today. What luck it is writer Melinda M. Snodgrass. Hello, Melinda. Yay. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And we so really appreciate you. To catch mm -hmm. up and to make new friends because I haven't met you in Chirag. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, You'll we never get rid of them now, Melinda. I know, that's it. <laughs> never that's be able it. to shake them. They, they <laughs> don't already, I, I've already invited them to Santa Fe. So. <laughs> oh. God, yeah. God, I already God, booked my flight. Be careful, be careful what you what you wish for. I'm telling you, yeah. they're like Velcro. They're like Velcro. We're coming. We're coming. adorable <laughs> Velcro. <though. laughs> uh, very quickly, uh, this episode was sponsored by two of our very good friends, David Gregory and Anil O. Palat. Thank you so much for sponsoring this episode, Dave Gregory and Anil yeah. O. Palat. And of oh, course, wow. Denise is back. We're so grateful to have her back as our co-host. That's yes. it. Let's have a ton of fun together, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, Melinda, this is the first episode that you are credited uh, as a writer on The Next Generation. But I noticed after that, you are credited as it's seemingly part of the writer's room after that. Was it because of this episode that all the writers were like, whoa? Hang on a second. We need you. Or how did this come about? Uh, I have to roll back a little bit. Um, my best friend is George R. R. Martin, a little known writer. We're hoping that he'll break big here someday. <laughs> One of these days. <laughs> and, uh, George had gone out to Hollywood to work on first the new Twilight Zone and then on Beauty and the Beast. And George called me one day from L.A. He was living out in L.A. And he called me and said, hey, Snod, um, I think you'd be real good at this screenwriting thing. And if you'll write a spec script, I'll show it to my agent. Now, I was a book author. I had quit being a lawyer. I was a novelist. You know, that's how I got to know George. And I was like, well, that sounds cool. <laughs> so I um, looked around and had to decide what to write for. And I had grown up on Trek. I was a little kid. I loved original Trek. And I saw a new Trek was starting. And so I started watching. And and um, and George had given me all this, you know, he told me about how if you write a spec script, you never, ever, ever, ever sell your spec script. It's just a calling card. It'll just get you in the door to pitch. And um, as I was watching the show, I had been an attorney and constitutional law was my specialty. And as I was watching it, I thought, oh, my gosh, I can use the Dred Scott decision, which was an infamous Supreme Court decision, which ruled that a slave brought into a free territory was still just property. And he could not sue for his freedom, even though he was in now a free territory. And I thought I can use that for data. But. I called George and I said, look, I've got this idea for a script and I think it's really pretty good. And if I'm never going to sell it, maybe I should save it for pitching and write a different script because I have some other ideas. And George gave me the best advice I've ever gotten as a writer. He said to me, never hoard your silver bullet, hmm. meaning lead with the best thing you have, the thing you're most passionate about. And um, so I did. So I wrote The Measure of a Man. And wow. then he, you know, it got sent to his agent and his agent sent it to Trek. And then I got this phone call that they wanted to meet me and to come out to L.A. So I did. And I had all my cards with my extra, the other episodes I'd worked up. And um, when I met M Maury, uh, Morris Hurley, he I started to, he asked about me and, you know, my background and, you know, we were talking and then I said, well, I have these other ideas. And he went, Shh. and he pointed at the whiteboard behind his desk that had a list of the 
next episodes they were going to be shooting. And the Measure of a Man was on that shooting schedule. Wow. So I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Um, and then and then there was a hiccup. Uh, I we came home to New Mexico thinking, oh, I saw the script. And George is like, damn you, you, you made me a liar. I told you you'd never sell it. Um, <laughs> and then um, I get home and there was this weird hiccup where Gene decided to call and give me notes on the script. And the first thing he said to me was that there were no lawyers in the 24th century. <laughs> and that data would be delighted to be taken apart. And and I was like, so I just said to him, well, Mr. Roddenberry, then we don't have a script. <laughs> and, um, wow. and then Maury found out and got back on the phone with me. And Maury was like, get back out here right now. So I fly back to Los Angeles. And I sat in a meeting and they gave me notes, um, things to rewrite on the script for three hours. And they said, well, this won't work. What would you do? And at the end of the three hours, Maury said, I'm hiring you and you start on Monday. So I got hired for the show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, wow. that was, that was um, and, and it was in, I mean, it was, you know, I was, I had been a lawyer. I'm used to making, you know, correcting, dealing with things on a timeline and, and on a schedule. Um, and also I've been a novelist. So, you know, you get notes and you make changes. And um, I mean, for example, I didn't have the poker game wasn't the initial teaser of my spec script. What was I, I uh. had data learning how to swim because <laughs> I thought you could read all the books, but you've never actually been in the water. And I had found out from Rick and from uh, Mike Akuda that data weighed like 400 plus pounds. So what I wanted, he's like, okay, I'm ready. Oh, and he gets in the pool and sinks like a stone. And then he has to walk across the bottom of the pool and comes up the other side. And Maury said, we can't do that. We suck at going on location first. He said, we are just are terrible at it. And he said, also Brent's makeup will wash off. So we need, you need a different teaser. They ended up actually using that in a in a subsequent, I don't remember if it was in an episode or a movie, but they actually ended up using that where data sinks to the bottom and and just walks out. I feel really? like it may I feel like it may have been a movie. I don't remember, but I remember that was so used. Then yes. I, well, then I needed something, so I came yeah. up with a poker game. Well, I mean, and first of all, why would data weigh 400 pounds? At this point, I mean, what you know, metal and all that stuff is getting lighter and lighter as we speak. I, I don't know. I mean, that was just what the tech guys who wrote the, you know, they had said he was, and I just thought it would be a funny moment. You know, I thought it would be oh, a funny totally. moment. Totally. It is. Totally. But, um, but they couldn't do it. So instead, they played poker. And uh, then it became this thing, you know, for all the rest of the show. Yeah. So, well, it became an integral you know, plot point in a, in a way, this poker game, you know, this, this yeah. significance of, of, you know, how you can yeah. read all, all you want, but at a certain point, you know, when do your senses kick in, you know, right. when do you fake, you know, when, when do you, when, when are you able to read the room kind of yeah. thing? It was a really nice kind of point about that. So it was, you know, the thing I could come up with that would, do the same thing for data to not understand bluffing and in you know, all of these these various yeah, things. So, yeah. So that's how I ended up on staff on Star Trek. Was wow, so you moved you moved from Santa Fe to I LA. Moved down to LA. Right yeah. then. Yeah, right then. I mean that was a Thursday they gave me notes and Maury said I had to start on Monday. So wow. I flew home, I packed up my car and I looked back to LA. Man. And you know, forever I mean Look, everybody is aware that Star Trek was not an easy show. I mean, it was, but I am grateful because it taught me new skills, thanks to Ira Baer, um, who really was my mentor, and Hans mm -hmm. Meimler and Rick Manning. Um, mm -hmm. I learned so much working with them, and it launched my Hollywood career. So despite the other stuff, it was still, right. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunities that it gave me. So. Absolutely, I get that. I believe me, I get that most of yeah. <laughs> more than anyone, more than most. <laughs> yeah. I, yes, 
you and I share a bond. Well, that. you know, had you been on the staff, I may have reconsidered. You know, I mean, you were not you, you were the missing a missing link because this script is tremendous, tremendous. I mean, there are there are beautiful, beautiful lines um, of that that just stop you in your tracks that, oh, that are written here. Oh. And, you know, that that that's what I was was looking for that wasn't, uh, you know, there in the in the first season. It was just, you know, not there. Yeah, so, I, that was it was, you know, I I'm a very passionate writer and ultimately I ended up being too passionate for, for Trek. You mm. know, I was always running up against Rick saying, cut it down, cut it down. You know? mm. <laughs> no. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> Melinda, I want to uh, give you a lot of credit for how wonderful this episode is. I, I want to say this is, uh, in my opinion, the best episode that I've watched so far leading up until this point. So that would be two seasons and eight episodes. I think it's the best, uh, the best written episode and really ta tackles some important keys that I think become uh, principal themes throughout Star Trek. And one of them is about uh, sentient beings and what is a sentient being. And I thought you made a very good kind of debate about the philosophical arguments of what a sentient being is. Uh, a, a topic that's often covered in science fiction, but I thought you did a very good job in this episode with that. And yeah. also, yeah, I, I mean, it was, it, it, there were quotes all over this episode that I couldn't stop writing down. So there wasn't any wow. space in my notes. Wow. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's a but, lot of quotes. I did that too. Yeah. My notes are just yeah, full of too. quotes. Yeah. Me too. And, and, yeah. So that just to me tells me how great the writing is. And, um, yeah, I felt as a viewer that you touched on some of the sensitivities of uh, what slavery kind of means to us when we look back on it. At least when I look back on it, I think of uh, being viewed as property. And that was one of the themes that was also well covered in this episode that struck a nerve for me was the idea of being considered property and not having a free will or the choice to decide where you go, what's going to happen to you. And uh, you use data as the vehicle for that storytelling. But still, that is something that's happened for uh, for human beings on this planet throughout time. And it's a real story that we've had to deal with as a society. So um, I want to credit you for just bringing that, all of those key elements to this story and making this episode so enjoyable to watch. Um, let me ask you some of the challenges that I wanted to see how you dealt with. One of them is you had multiple characters that nobody had seen before, including the JAG officer Phillips, as well as the science guy, um, Bruce Alex. Maddox. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, it's not and easy Admiral to introduce Nakamura, right, uh, Admiral Nakamura as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, did you run up against resistance for having these many new characters inside of this episode or was it something that was kind of part of the storytelling? No, it was, it, nobody ever brought that up. Um, I mean, the, you know, we weren't allowed to be in casting on Star Trek, but um, initially they were going to cast a sort of really pretty little blonde uh, to play Philippa. And Maury fought against that. He wanted somebody who came across as tougher, you know, and, and, you know, I just hinted that there was a backstory between Picard and Philippa. Mm. You know, just I just sort of threw it in as a little hint. But again, you don't play the backstory. If you're playing the backstory, then that ought to be the story. You know, that you shouldn't be messing with it. So I just sort of left that hint so that there was some tension and and issues between them. Um, that could play out, but no, I, it, it went, it went fine. I mean, there was never a problem with it. Um, I mean, the biggest challenge was um, when I initially wrote the script, um, I didn't have Guinan in it. Uh, Whoopi wasn't in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I was on the job. I'd moved to LA and we were getting ready to shoot and I got called into Maury's office and he said, uh, we've been looking over Whoopi's contract and she's 
got to be in 13 or whatever, 14 episodes. And if we don't put her in measure, we're not going to meet her con- our contractual obligation. So I need you to go write a scene for Guinan. Mm-hmm. And, um, and in many ways, that pressure, I spent like three and a half hours just pacing in my little office trying to, and then I figured out what I wanted to do. And I went downstairs and said, can I do this? This is what I, and Maury said, go write it. Um, and I think in some ways that's the heart of the, that scene is the heart of the script. Uh, there's um, no question, no question. She, you, you, in now you layer on that added element of, you know, the, the, the enslaved people, property, you know, and you're, right. you're, you you so seamlessly introduce those two very, that will stand on their own apart right. from each other, the sentient being and the property now, and you layer that. You you weave that together in the in the trial. It was like I'm going, whoa, wow. Okay, we're here at this level, and now we've just dropped down another notch. In the yeah, and credit and credit to Whoopi in that performance as well yes. because oh, the way really? she yep. the way she delivers those lines, she doesn't oh. go over the top. She's not even angry. It's very no, it's, sort of it's almost it's a it's yes. a sadness to her tone that's like, well, this is the reality, and, and that. That hit. I love yeah. too how, you know, she's clearly we don't know a lot about Guinan, or at least you know when I was on the show, and the sense that she's taking Picard, who's almost like a child, that she's leading him toward the conclusion. Right. You know, this she's discovering. teaching him and helping him discover what's yeah. really at stake. And I just, I mean, her performance was just. Um, yeah, it, it takes your breath away. She was it amazing. totally does. And she's so beautiful. She's so mm-hmm. elegant and beautiful. You can't yeah. take your eyes off of her, you know, her face, her skin. I mean, everything. I just, you, the camera is just, you know, loving her at this moment. Yeah. And the lines, the lines that you yeah, have, disposable creatures that do the dirty work. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's, yes. that's, that's, that's still a reality today um, for a lot of people on this planet that feel that yes. sense of disposableness oh. and that are that feel like they're doing the dirty work. And I, that's, yeah. that's a real sentiment that I thought was hit very well. I like the way Picard receives the information. He hears it and then receives it. But the way uh, Whoopi delivers it is just fantastic. Um, and just the lines, you can't seize people, um, you know, talking about property. I, another thing I wanted to ask you about Melinda is that you inadvertently touched on something that is a very big topic today. And that is, <laughs> you know, the pronoun identification with data being called mm, it. Yes. It mm. was offending me every time I heard it. It was, it was <laughs> mm-hmm. bothering me. Me too. <laughs> And, wow. and, and 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 such a foresight for for and you didn't have a, a direct oh well, you did and there was a moment in which at the end uh, Doctor uh, Bruce Maddox says he's a you know he's an amazing guy or something to that effect and you bro- you 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 acknowledge the change in pronoun from it to he and mm-hmm. I, I just wanted to say that's another mm. uh, example of very clever writing and 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 also you identifying something. And hitting a nerve in the language with the pronouns. So I, I want to credit you uh, as well for that, Melinda. Of course, now I'm starting to get the feeling I hadn't even thought of that. So thank you. That's a really fascinating insight. And now I'm like, okay, is Florida going to ban Measure a Man? Is Florida not going <laughs> to show that episode again? Because we're dealing with issues of race and slavery and pronouns. And I'm like, Hmm. <laughs> you know, what's what's going to happen? But but, feel, but feel yeah, it's groundbreaking. Feel proud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. If I got banned, it would be great. And let me ask you also. Um, so now, as you're approaching and you're in on the staff, and you're becoming, you know, you're, you're part of the writing. Do you approach your scripts with the same uh, lawyer's eye? Uh, so are you thinking about when you're writing or when you're looking at scripts like, you know, how this impacts uh, the, the significance of how this will impact societally? Like, I think that was one of the things about brought up in this episode 
uh, where uh, Picard tells, um, you know, the judge in this case, Philippa, Philippa that mm -hmm. remember what this decision is going to mean going forward. It'll impact farther on down the line than just the one decision you have here which will affect our liberty and freedom. And that's one of the great you know, quotes of the episode as well. Um, do you now, do you approach the writing with that same kind of, the, how does this have an impact look, going forward um, for society and culture? Yeah, I do. Um, I, you know, I, I hated being a lawyer. I loved going to law school. I loved the study of law. I didn't like being a lawyer. But I have used it in almost all of my writing, my books, um, my scripts, um, because, you know, without law, you know, it's the foundation for civilization. You have to have some sort of agreements between people and um, and a way to, uh, you know, work out issues and debates and, and conflicts that are going to arise. Um, so, yeah, I do write with that in mind. And it's actually been one of the weaknesses of science fiction. Uh, mm -hmm. certainly in prose for the longest time, is that we don't look at economics and we don't look at law. We, you know, are as always whiz bang, spaceships, aliens, fights, and so forth. But, you know, the way cultures are going to have to interact is to find a common, common ground, a place from which to negotiate. So, yeah, I think to some degree that's always, you know, playing in the back of my mind is what is this? And, you know, to, to, be a little critical here. They sort of threw all that away in the first season of Picard, which is the only one I watched. But it was like, oh, and look, we've built all these robots. And I was like, didn't you? Just, wasn't the whole thing <laughs> of Metro Man that you're not supposed to build an army of robots? And yet they based that season on on Measure of a Man, and then they kind of ignored the whole point of Measure of a Man, which was, you know, hey, let's not do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a little bit baffled by by that, but uh, that choice. But hey, you know. They also uh, mentioned uh, Bruce Maddox. Uh, Bruce Maddox was in, I believe, a couple yeah, episodes the, of the first he season was the of the MacGuffin. Part. They were all looking for Bruce Maddox. He was oh. like the ultimate MacGuffin. In, mm -hmm. in, yeah. Yeah, there and are a lot of things started. just yeah. very quickly, yeah. Melinda, there are so many things in this one episode that you started for all of Star Trek. Bruce Maddox, for example. Uh Admiral Nakamura is in a couple more episodes. Uh the uh data sink into the bottom of a lake. Uh, but the big one that I noticed was the poker game. I don't believe they played it played poker in any of the, the episodes before no. this. But First since appearance. that, it became kind of a hallmark of the next generation. It was the heart of next generation. There are so many episodes that include that. And that's even how Star Trek Picard series, spoilers, ends with a poker game. Yes. And I, when I saw this here, I realized, are mm -hmm. you the person that created this whole poker lore for the next yeah. generation? Yes, that's I unbelievable. <laughs> you got to hang your hat on that. It is huge. Right? And, and, and where, and where does your uh, interest, knowledge of poker come from? <laughs> <laughs> um, mostly, it's because I thought it would be more interesting. I played bridge. I'm not much of a gambler, so I was okay. a bridge player. But I thought it would be fun, you know, because I needed something with bluffing, you know, because bridge is mm -hmm. all about betting, and you know. Um, and it, it's all right out there. I wanted something where data would be puzzled, um, but but you didn't have anything. No, that's the whole point, data. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. So poker yeah. was the logical, you know, conclusion. And also, I've had friends. I mean, George, who started all this with me. Uh, George used to love to. I mean, he was a big poker player at science fiction conventions. He and some of the guys, you know. And so I, you know, I'm aware of it, and um, yeah. but not necessarily a player myself but it just seemed like the right choice to to get across what i wanted to get across so that's what i did no. the bluff the bluff can i can i ask um where was that your um idea to to bring tasha's hologram up yes 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 so you <laughs> had you had seen or you had you were aware of of our relationship I, watched all of the episodes before uh, I ever tried to I, I watched all the episodes and 
I have done some acting, stage acting. I was a singer. I, I studied opera in Europe before I came back and went to law school. So I've done all these crazy things. Very cool. Um, and so I had watched all the episodes and I also practiced while I watched repeating the lines in the way all of you talked so that I nice. knew how to mm -hmm. do it. I mean, I still say all my dialogue aloud, whether I'm writing a script mm -hmm. or a novel, but I would play it, repeat it, stop the tape, you know, or stop the recording, repeat the line, listen again, so that I got the rhythm of how people talked for the show. So I was very aware of the relationship between Data and Tasha. And so, you know, I wanted that as he was like, you know, it reminds me of her, not that it's an emotional thing for him, but that it was a memory he wants to keep in his memory banks of right. her. So right. that was, you know, because that's always the balance with data is you can't make him emotional, but you also, I mean, humans are watching this. And, you know, if he was just a computer, he wouldn't be terrible. I mean, to be honest, he was the most, by the time I got to the show, he was always the most interesting character, which is kind of sad because he was a robot. But, <laughs> um, but, you know, he wanted to learn and change and understand yeah. humans so there was some growth for him and right. everybody else was just so perfect <laughs> you know exactly that's what i was always fighting against by the way but but back to that hologram that so and now we come to the end of you know the third season picard and and the hologram reappears mm-hmm I, yeah. Again, I, I, I only know I haven't yeah. seen it either, but but I have I know about that. You know, it does. everybody. Yeah. We, we've we seen it. it. And yeah. spoiler. Yes. Tasha's hologram does come back again in the season three of Picard. So again, right. Melinda, they reuse your idea yes. once again, yeah. including all the from program, one episode, including this the hologram. Amazing. <laughs> so, and, and that uh, hologram. <laughs> That ho that because of that hologram, because data has that cube, and that hologram speaks volumes in terms of the um, the 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 story, the definitive storyline of this of of what the next generation is. You know, you know that now there is this deepening and this resonance. Be, between the these two characters because of that hologram right, you know, right. that yeah. that that he holds that that has huge significance and to mm -hmm. include that in picard you know i talked to terry metallis about it he he as, as a child was is watching the next gen right you know, as a little yeah. boy yeah. dreaming yeah. of one day writing for this show that he wow. takes that and brings it with him into when he's able to do it. Maybe so that's a card, you know, could I have a little card somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like with the card I really did, based on the script, Measure of a Man, right. by Stodgrass. Right. Uh, yeah. I, well, well, everyone I, knows I, that. that. I'm, I'm so glad that that, that, that happened, that, um, that, you know, that relationship and that Tasha and you just weren't erased out of Star Trek lore, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. Thank you. And and, and Brent, Thank by you. the way, played that <laughs> moment very well too. I want to give Brent his credit because I will agree with you, Melinda. I do feel like uh, sorry, Brent Spiner's character uh, really was a big central, you know, engine driving this show. And um, one of the things that I thought he did well was play that moment. And I thought the moment itself was written very well because he pauses when the hologram comes up and he mm -hmm. says, uh, they're like, well, who is this? And he, he says something to the effect of, uh, well, she's uh, someone special to me, you know? Um, and there was a sensitivity there. And he said, I'd rather not, I'd rather not tell you what happened right right yeah. because there's a privacy there as well 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, he uh, respects like, that and the, the experience they shared. And so, yeah. Right. And then he finally gives it up because Picard looks at him like, bro, you're about to die. If you don't say something. <laughs> yeah. And so, he's like, I think she'll be okay with it under the circumstances. Yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. sweet. Yeah. That was very sweet. Yes. I that thought Picard it was a great. said Tasha would be okay with it. Yes. I like the way you wrote that because it, it it played out well, in my opinion, yeah. because it, it it he was protecting his secret with her and his moment with her, but he was also respectfully giving away the details without being, um, I thought, um, overly repulsive in a masculine way, kind of, you know. Um, yeah. That's where another thing that you bring to the table, Melinda, is, is the uh, sensitivity of a woman because in the beginning of these episodes, we saw a heavy lean towards a male chauvinistic point of view in the first season of this next generation. And we have been um, looking for more uh, balanced kind of approach to the storytelling. I felt like there was a more chauvinistic point. I know DC Fontana was there and there were other people doing things, but I felt like you had more of an understanding about how to approach certain situations for example how did the how were you able to convince roddenberry that lawyers do exist in the future (laughs) i was really lucky gene got sick and he was not around (laughs) for six weeks and in that six weeks period they got that script to the to the set and they shot it, and then it was too late. And the oh. funny thing was, I was on a panel with David Gerald, who wrote The Trouble of Tribbles. Mm-hmm. And so it's David Gerald, George Martin, and me on this panel. Wow. And I tell the story about, well, Gene got sick, and he wasn't around, and so we were able to shoot the show as I wrote it, rather than it getting you know torn apart. And, and David <laughs> looks over and he says, you know, when I did Tribbles, Gene hated the trouble with Tribbles because Star Trek wasn't funny, but he went on vacation for three weeks and we shot it while he was on <laughs> And George is sitting between us and he just starts howling with laughter like, oh my God, you know, it's like <laughs> two of the scripts that people love got through yeah. because, you know, right. they managed to sneak them through. Um, mm. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, Gene... <laughs> It was the whole, like the whole no money thing made me crazy. And the fact that people were perfect. I mean, you know, I, what measure did I was able to have conflict between the characters. I was able to have Picard and Riker on, on opposite sides. Mm, And and that was such a nice change from everybody just being so, you know, we're all together. (laughs) Right. Even even Picard and Philippa had a conflict there. There yeah. was yeah. that, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, butting just, of heads. She brought back this the idea of this uh, this the stargazer. You actually brought that up again. Another kind of recall in the script where you're bringing back um, storyline that we've heard before. Yeah, yeah, just trying to you know give some sense that there's depth and people interact with each other, and you know that yes. was what I wanted. So yeah. yeah. Well, that, uh, that's it's interesting. It's interesting looking at um, uh, Amanda McBroom, I, who plays um, Philippa. Philippa. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys have similar. You, you have similar coloring and qualities. I didn't know she was. I mean, since we weren't permitted, in I mean, she'd be like you. You know, she was you, cast I, to be you. I think I yeah. that's what you, it seemed I'm like, like to me too. Uncanny. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if Maury no, would have tried to find a redhead or what, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. isn't so, that uh, interesting? Yeah. Well, like uh, you're doing the role, Melinda. Yeah. Uh, boy, oh boy, this has been so much fun, and we have so much more to talk with you about. So we hope that you will come back. Uh, many more times. We have a few more excuses to have you back in the future. So hopefully uh, you will be joining us again. But this has been amazing. Uh, You wrote an amazing script. You made us laugh. Uh, You changed the course of Star Trek. And that's not an exaggeration. You actually did change the course of Star Trek. Still to this day, we're feeling the effects of it and the references. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. 
Thank you so much for having me. It was lovely getting to know you two gentlemen and getting to see Denise and chat. Yeah. And, and I hope they get everything fixed at the house with all the rain. <laughs> you can send it all to Mexico. So, we'll get there. You did, you so did a fantastic fun. job in this episode. We I loved it from start to finish. Yeah. Um, really a highlight of this uh, first two seasons for me. And I uh, just wanted to congratulate you on the ineffable quality <laughs> to, to oh, use oh. one of your lines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say this. Data is a toaster. <laughs> data is a toaster. Yeah. Data yeah. Is a toaster. Yeah. Uh, I laughed out loud. <laughs> that is so yeah. matter of factly, you know, exclamation yeah. point. Okay. He's a toaster. <laughs> <laughs> so melinda uh we've heaped praise on you just now after you're gone we're going to continue to heap more praise on you uh yeah. but again thank you so much for this we hope to see you again real soon everybody stick around uh we've got a lot more coverage of this glorious episode and we'll be right back on the seventh rule <laughs>